I will tell you that uh, this morning Ryan was supposed to preach. And then he realized about a month ago that the Sunday that he was supposed to preach, he was also supposed to be in Honduras on a mission trip. And uh, he couldn't figure out how he could do both of those. So he said, uh, hey, Grant, I don't think I can preach on this one. And I said, okay, no problem. I got it. Then I looked and I was like, no wonder I wanted him to preach. Why? Because it's the tithe. We're going to talk about tithing today. And John said a couple of weeks ago that, that he didn't like to preach about, talk, about giving and he didn't like to talk about money. Well, you know, I told my wife yesterday, I said, I'm going to just say, doesn't bother me a bit. <laughs> Dennis Swanberg described his baptism this way. He says, I was dunked under the water and held there until I said tithe. A little girl became restless as a preacher's sermon dragged on and on and on. Finally, she leaned over to her mother and whispered, Mommy, if we give him the money now, will he let us go? And three boys were in the schoolyard, and they were bragging about their fathers. The first boy said, My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls them a poem. They give him $50. The second boy says, That's nothing. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, and he calls it a song, and they give him $100. The third boy says, I got you both beat. My dad scribbles a, scribbles a few pieces of words on a piece of paper. He calls it a sermon, and it takes eight people to collect all the money. <laughs> but yes, we're going to talk about tithing. I'm going to tell you how I turned, learned to tithe. I, I learned by observation from two people sitting on the back row back here, my parents. I learned by observation by just seeing them consistently writing a check and dropping a check in the offering plate. But let me tell you how I, I learned specifically to tithe. And it's from a man who used to attend this church, passed away a few years ago, by the name of Wendell Thomas. Wendell was my uncle. Uh, Wendell was a, a construction general contractor. And all of my family, all of the cousins in my family, all the boys, at some point in our lives, we all work for Uncle Wendell. Well, I started working for Uncle Wendell at the age of 10. Yes, I know, that was illegal. If there's anybody from OSHA or anything like that, my cousins were babysitting me, okay? And while they babysat me, they just happened to say, hey, look, there's a bunch of trash. Go pick it up. So my job was to clean up when all of the different crews would go through. I would clean up the houses, clean up all the mess. And my Uncle Wendell paid me the grand total of $20 a day. Now, this was 1980. I was 10 years old. I thought $20 a day meant I was a millionaire. I mean, I was stinking rich. Well, I worked for him. He, he waited until I had worked five days to give me my first paycheck. And, man, I was so excited. You know, I couldn't wait. I was going to get a $100 bill in my hand. Oh, it was going to feel so good. So I go to Uncle Wendell. And if you know Uncle Wendell, you know that it wasn't just a matter of walking up saying, hey, Uncle Wendell, it's you know, Friday, and he would go, oh, yeah, great, and give you your paycheck. No, Uncle Wendell had to make a production. He, for like 10 minutes, he fussed and griped and groaned and complained. That was just my Uncle Wendell. He had to tell like five stories. And I am sitting there, and you know, all of my cousins were really, truly were terrified of Uncle Wendell. I was probably the only one that wasn't. And the only reason I wasn't is because I was his baby sister's baby. And, and, I, and I knew that when my grandfather on that side had passed away, he had told Uncle Wendell, he'd take care of my baby girl and her kids. And so I was the only one that wasn't scared of Uncle Wendell. And I just sit and listen to him for a little bit. Finally, I was like, Uncle Wendell, are you going to pay me? And he said, yes. And the moment came, man, he reaches in his wallet. And the first time he pays me, he pays me in cash. And he brings out a bill. And he puts this bill in my hand. And I look at that bill and I'm thinking, Uncle Wendell, you're really bad at math. Because this bill should have had an extra zero at the end. It was a $10 bill. And, you know, I mean, I was 10 years old, but I could do math. Five days at $20 a day without having to pay Uncle Sam... I should be getting $100, but it's only 10 and Then Uncle Wendell looks at me and he says, son, that's your tithe. And it better be in the offering plate, in an envelope, with your name on it, on Sunday, 
at First Baptist. And then he added, and I'll know because I count the money. <laughs> well, okay, I wasn't terrified of Uncle Wendell, but I think was smart enough to know that when Uncle Wendell told you to do something, you better do it. And so I learned that day that I give 10% right up front, right off the top, no questions asked, that I give 10%. And that is a lesson that I am so thankful that my Uncle Wendell taught me. Because I'm going to tell you, putting a $10 bill in the offering plate is a whole lot easier than trying to learn how to tithe when you make real money, big money. Uh, my wife worked for a dentist in Bellevue who had not long before become a believer. And one of the things that he said to, to my wife was, you know how hard it is to tithe? And Denise said, no, it's not hard at all. And he said, yeah, you don't know how many numbers are on the check I have to write. Denise and I learned to tithe as children. When we got married, it wasn't even a discussion. Uh, we didn't even discuss whether we were going to tithe. It was just an assumption that, yes, we were going to give 10%. But for her boss, who had gone all these years not tithing, and now is recognizing, man, I, I need to be giving. It's hard. So our you learn to tithe now. We're going to talk about why, but learn to tithe now, because it's a whole lot easier if your tithe just gradually increases than if you wake up one day and you're making a lot of money and you're having to try to figure out how to tithe then. It is not fun. Learn now, and God will bring blessings on your life. So is the tithe something that we ought to practice? Well, I want to tell you, yes, it is. If you've got a Bible, turn to Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. It says here, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Notice that last phrase. It is holy to the Lord. Well, what is this word tithe? Very simply, it is related to the word for ten. It means a tenth. It's a proportion of your income. One of the things I love about the fact that, that God puts in the tithe and, and says to us that we should, should tithe is that if you make very little, the proportion of that that you give is small. If you make a lot, the proportion becomes bigger. The number becomes bigger. But it's not, it doesn't say you have to give X number of dollars. It's a proportion. It's a tenth. Some will read this and they'll say, well, okay, Grant, that's great that in the Mosaic Covenant we were told to tithe. <coughs> this isn't the first time that you read of the followers of God tithing. You can go back into Genesis. And Abraham, did we see that this was practiced by the followers of God from the very beginning. Abraham, when he rescues Lot from those that had, had captured him, and, and they had they rescued him, they come back, and they come back to Jerusalem, or what became Jerusalem. Melchizedek, the priest of God, comes out. And what does Abraham do? Abraham takes a tithe, a tenth of everything that they've captured. And he gives it to Melchizedek as an offering to God, as a tithe of everything that he had captured. And so if you say, you know, all oh, the, the tithe is only taught in, in the Old Testament, in the Mosaic Covenant. Well, no, it goes back before that. And, and the way that Abraham, the way that passage reads, it gives the indication that this wasn't something unusual for Abraham. It wasn't something that he just went, light bulb, I should give it 10%. That it was just his practice. That he took it and immediately gave it. No questions asked. The idea being that it was something that had already been practiced way before even Abraham. The tithe belongs to God. Here it says that it is holy to the Lord. It is the unrestricted property of God. 
Folks, you and I do not own the tithe. The 10% of your income that belongs to God is not yours. It's His. Interestingly, I had a friend who served in the Navy. Uh, he was a chief warrant officer in the U.S. Navy, stationed on uh, an island out off the coast of Washington. It was in the first church that I served as pastor. And I was talking with him one time. We were talking about getting out and done a sermon on tithing. And he came in and he was talking to me. And he said, you know, he said, Grant, he said, it's interesting that you talk about that. He said, in his position with the Navy, he does a lot of financial counseling. Guys, you know, under him that come in, 18, 19, 20-year-old kids that are coming in, and, and they're drowning in debt because they're just getting into life. You know, they get a paycheck, and all of a sudden they get all these credit card offers, and they're drowning in debt, and they come to him and say, you know, gee, how do I, what do I do? How do I get out of this? And, and he said the first thing he tries to find out is, is the person who believes him. If the person who is coming to him is a Christian, then he comes back and he said, the first thing I tell the, the Christians, you need to give away 10% to your church. You need to tie it to your church. And he said, they always look at me and think, and say, look at me like I'm crazy. You know, they're saying, wait a second, I, you know, I came here because I'm, I got too much money, and not, or too much debt, and too much month, and I don't have enough money, and you're telling me I need to spend an extra of 10%? And he said, yes. But what was really interesting is he said, if he finds out that they're not believers, not Christians, he too still tells them that they need to give away 10% of their income, even the secular causes. And interestingly, he said he, he, is, he did some research and he found secular authors, non-Christians, that write on money matters. And that all of them say you should give away 10% of your income. What he said was interesting to me is that the ones who took his advice and went back and, and he said even those who were not believers that would start to give away 10% of their income to Salvation Army or Red Cross or whatever, he said those guys would come back in and every time they would say, I don't understand I'm giving money away that I don't have. And somehow, I have more money. They go, this makes absolutely no sense. And he said he loved doing it because when they would come back to him, he would say, you know what, you're right. From a human perspective, it makes no sense. But we're not dealing with human man. You're dealing with God's math. And God's math is a little different. Because somehow in God's math, 90% equals more than 100%. And he would say to him, I, don't, I can't explain it to you except to say that the scriptures tell us that the tithe belongs to God. It is his. And if you withhold that tithe, that you are, as we're going to read in just a minute, you are robbing God. And you don't rob God without consequences. And so he would say to them, you're holding back from God. And it always brings consequences. If we are obedient to God, he will bring blessings in our life. When you study the tithe out, you find out that not only did the people of Israel tithe, and, and who they gave their tithes to, is not told us here, but whether who they gave their tithes to, they gave their tithes to the Levites. And then the Levites would take their portion of that, and the Levites themselves would tithe, and they would tithe to the priests. Well, I believe that, that the scriptures tell us in our day and age where we should tie this to the local church. That we should give our 10% to our local body. To the, the place that, that we gather together to worship and to learn and to grow. That we give that 10%. If we say that, if we take the mentality that the church or the, the tithe goes to the church, 
Just as in the Old Testament, the tithe went to the Levites, then I believe as a church that we should practice the tithe also. That we should give away at least 10% of our income. Now, because of the organization that we're a part of, the Southern Baptist Convention, where we should tithe is to the Southern Baptist Convention. We call it the Cooperative Program. Over the last year, we have increased our giving to the cooperative program from our undesignated receipts. Just what you just dropped in the offering plate, we've increased that. We are now at, I believe, eight and a half percent this year. We've, we've gone up about a percent and a half since I came. Our goal is we want to get that one to 10 percent. Now, we are already giving above 10 percent to causes outside of ourselves as a church. We want to raise that up. We want to get that to where we're giving at least 10% straight to the cooperative program. Why? Because if we ask you as members of the church to tithe, we as a church ought to set that some practice first. And yes, we already give above 10%. We have ultimately, I've told the missions committee, I'd love to see us get to the point where 20% of what comes into this building goes out, not just not just outside of us, but goes out into mission organizations around the world. We're going to get there. We're going to just continue to build a little bit at a time. But over the past year and a half, God has blessed this church financially. He's taken care of us. And if you ask me why, I would say it's because we as a church have taken the steps to give more than we had. That we have taken the steps that we have made a commitment that we're going to get to that time and then we're moving there. We're, we're going in the right direction. And I think God looks down from heaven and says, yes, that's what I want to see. The tithe belongs to God. Very simple. It is His property. It is not yours. It is not mine. It is God's. He commands us to give it. We've got about to turn back to Malachi. Pretty much any time a guy is going to preach on tithing, this one is going to come. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. And he says, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet, you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. There's a promise in there. Both this and the passage in Haggai chapter 1, let me read this, Haggai chapter 1, verse 9. It says, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of the heaven, heavens, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the grain produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. In both of these passages, the background is the people of Israel, or at least a portion of the people of Israel, have returned to the promised land. Uh, the promised land is now at least nominally under Jewish control. They've come back home. But the people are desperately poor. The people are in poverty at academic levels. Most of the Jews live at a subsistence level, truly wondering where they were going to have enough food for the next day. There were a, a small fraction of the people of Israel that lived in splendor and poverty and wealth. But even those were struggling to get by. And there was 
within the entire nation this fear of, of how are we going to how are we going to survive? How are we going to make it? And in Malachi, you have something like a court case. God accuses the people of Israel. He says, "You have robbed me." You know, it's a serious thing to be charged with robbery of another man. How much more serious to be accused of robbing not man, not a mere mortal, as the NIV puts it, but to be accused of robbing God. That is exactly what God accuses him of. He says, you have robbed me. And you continue to rob me. And they say, well, wait, 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 God. How have we robbed you? He says, in tithes and offerings. You have not given back to me what is mine. You haven't even come close to, to going beyond the tithe, but you definitely have not. You haven't even given that 10% that, that God says, this is mine. It belongs to me. He says, you haven't given that. And because of that, there's misery. There's poverty. You have robbed me. There's a blessing there. This is the only place in Scripture that we are told to test God. Jesus, when he is, uh, when he is tempted by Satan, says, the, says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. But here, God himself says, test me on this. And what does he say to test him on? Give it as I have commanded. And just see if I don't pour out blessings. Now, I'm not saying that you tithe so that you'll get rich financially. I do not teach, this church does not teach the prosperity gospel, the health and wealth gospel. I don't teach that, that boy, you know, if you write a thousand dollar check to the church, that, that God is going to give you ten thousand dollars back. That's a bunch of garbage. But this verse very clearly tells us that God will make sure that our needs are met and that we will be blessed. Some of you may be blessed financially. Others of us will receive our blessings in ways that are more important than financially. But it very simply says that, that, that He will open the store gates of heaven and He will pour out His blessings on us. You know, you ever wonder if, if maybe that in your life you don't, hear, you don't hear God answer when you pray? Maybe it is the fact that you have been robbing God. And the reason He hasn't answered your prayers in the way that you would hope is because He says, I cannot pour my blessings out on you because you have not been obedient. Don't tie to be saved. Tithe because God promises. And we love Him. And we want to experience His blessing on our life. In Haggai, what it talks about there is that in that passage, again, post-exile, they're supposed to be building the temple. They're not building the temple. They're, they're spending money on their own houses and their own stuff. And, and God says, because you have not been faithful to the things that you said you were going to do, I am going to, I am taking my blessing off of you. I am taking off the blessing of rain, of moisture. The land of Israel is so consistent in its rainfall that they know exactly when to, to plant so that they know exactly so they can get it planted at the perfect time for the rains to fall. I mean, it is like clockwork. Every year, I would, Denise and I were there, the, our tour guide said, I can give you the forecast from now, and he named off a time in the, in the future. He said, it will be every day in Jerusalem about whatever temperature to whatever temperature, and he said, and it will not rain. And then he gave a date, and he said, and at that date, he said, give or take a day or two, it will rain. 
Well, you know, I was kind of curious. So I remember later on that year, I went back and I actually looked up the the rain for the weather forecast for Jerusalem right at that time. And guess what? It rained exactly when he said it would. And he told us in about like two weeks. He said, for like two weeks, it'll rain. And then it stops. And he said, that's every single year. It doesn't. It's just perfect. Think about farmers. If you could be guaranteed that two weeks, you could know within a day or two that it's going to rain, you have your crops set out, right? Well, the people of Israel, that's the way they've operated. God says, because the people of Israel had not done what they had been commanded financially, that he was removing not just the rain, but the dew that came on the ground. And he said, you will, your crops will fail. And even what you do grow is just going to be blown away. You know, you ever feel like you get your paycheck? And you take it to the bank? And, and you look at the paycheck and you go, okay, man, we're, we're, we're good. You know, we're going to be fine this month because I know I got enough money. And then it's like, it just, it's gone. You ever had that? I know I have. There been times in my life that, that you just look and it's like all of the, all of the income just seems to blow away. I'll tell you what happens when I look back. Those times when the income seems to just blow away, it is almost always a time when for some reason I forgot to write a tithe check and get it in. I don't understand how it works. But it does. When I'm faithful financially back to God, He pours out His blessings. But when I hold them back, it just all seems to disappear. Some of you may go, okay, Greg, that's all great. You've read the Old Testament. Tithing is an Old Testament practice. Yes, it is. So you may say, well, therefore, we know that, that we shouldn't have to practice the tithe. Okay, my first answer on that is always this. So, the Old Testament, who did not have Jesus, who, who just had this, this hope for the future, they were commanded to give a tithe, and yet you and I, who know that Jesus has died for our sins and that have been saved, that, that we that have the Spirit of God within us, that we are, we're under less of a command to give than the Old Testament? I'm sorry, that doesn't make sense to me. With how much God has done for us, we ought to look at the tithe and go, that's pretty cheap. And the tithe is the base. It's, it's not the goal. Our goal is is to give everything we can to God. The tithe is the base that you start. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, Jesus says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You hear that last part? You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Some people read this passage and they say, Oh, see, Jesus condemns the tithe. No, go back and read it. You should practice the latter, the faith, the mercy, the love, the kindness, all of those things. You should practice that. What? Without neglecting the former. And Jesus kind of takes the tithe as a, well, yeah, of course you're going to do that. That is the base commandment. To give the tithe. And so Jesus very clearly says, 
that as his followers, that we should give. That we should give of the time. That we should keep rocking God. Because there is a blessing when we give. Yes, Jesus condemns the Pharisees, but he does not condemn them for tithing. He condemns them for neglecting mercy and faith and love. Tithing is not the end of faithfulness. It's the beginning. And I will tell you, as you get right with God and give So many other things in your life will get better. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. <clears throat> yeah, if your heart is not sold out to God, start giving more to God. Because the more you give to God, the more your heart is going to follow. Why? Because it's where we're investing. We want to learn to love God more. If you recognize that something isn't right there, then start giving him more of your money. Give him more of your time. Give him more of your attention. You start putting your attention more on God throughout the day, you're going to recognize more of his love. You start to put more of your money towards God's causes. Your heart's going to be turning more to God's causes. You put more of your time to God's causes. Your heart's going to go more to God's causes. The, the tithe is the base. If you're not there, and statistics would tell us that the vast majority of us are not there. Randy said it, 2.3%. The average Christian in America might even say average evangelical Christian in America is 2.3%. That is far less than a tithe. And so, pure statistics would say that many of you are not giving a tithe. 